Londoners loved all kinds of shows. But if there was one character who came to represent the anarchic energy of the London crowd, it was Punch. His great belly, big nose, hump back and long stick made him the embodiment of a gross sexual joke which appealed to the lewd tastes of the London streets. He was violent too. Mr. Punch, where's my rent? Oh. Oh. By the middle of the 18th century, Punch had become a genuine Cockney hero. He's the essence of London's disorderly spirit. It is no surprise that he ends up in prison, the destiny of so many others from the London streets. London has often been described as a prison. It's dark, overcrowded, claustrophobic. It's a place where people have laboured and died for thousands of years. And the most hated symbol of the city's authority was the most terrible prison of them all, Newgate. The central criminal court, known as the Old Bailey, now stands on the site of Newgate Prison. The prison was originally built into a gatehouse in the old Roman wall. It was one of the thresholds to the city. And because it contained those condemned to die, it also became a gateway between this world and the next. Charles Dickens understood its power as a symbol of life and death for the London crowd. There, at the very core of London, in the heart of its business and animation, in the midst of a whirl of noise and motion, Stemming, as it were, the giant currents of life that flow ceaselessly on from different quarters and meet beneath its walls, stands Newgate. And in that crowded street on which it frowns so darkly, within a few feet of the squalid, tottering houses, upon the very spot on which the vendors of soup and fish and damaged fruit are now plying their trades, scores of human beings have been hurried violently and swiftly from the world. In the imagination of Londoners, Newgate became associated with hell. It produced utter degradation, an air so foul that it infected the neighbourhood. Lice and bedbugs teemed in such profusion that the floor crunched as he walked. It was a city within the city, run as a private business, with prisoners paying for their accommodation, enmeshed in a web of tips and bribes. The wretched crowd that filled Newgate fascinated the crowd that filled the streets outside. It fed a fashionable culture of criminal celebrity which reached its peak in the 18th century. Criminals have always had an especial place in the heart of the London crowd. From Dick Turpin, the highwayman, to the Cray brothers, ordinary Londoners have embraced those who set themselves outside the law. That's why Newgate Prison has produced some of London's most memorable heroes. <laughs> A thief and highwayman called Jack Shepherd escaped from prison six times, twice from Newgate, and became a London celebrity. A century later, poor London children who had never heard of Moses or Queen Victoria still knew the legend of Jack Shepherd. His hanging at Tyburn attracted the largest crowd the city had ever seen. The condemned approached execution with all the attention to detail of a star turn, and the audience was guaranteed. Hanging days were public holidays in order to encourage the London crowd to take to the streets for the spectacle. The Church of the Holy Sepulchre stands opposite the site of Newgate Prison. 
it too had a part to play in the unfolding drama. At midnight, on the eve of an execution, a bellman would walk along the tunnel connecting the church with the prison, tolling this handbell and reciting, All you that in the condemned hold do lie, prepare you, for tomorrow you shall die. And when St. Sepulchre's bell in the morning tolls, the Lord have mercy on your souls. London's ritual of punishment ended with a procession. The holiday crowd pressed in around Newgate and lined the streets as the convicted men and women were taken through the city in an open cart, up Hoban Hill, west towards Tyburn. The procession halted at the aptly named Resurrection Gate by St Giles in the Fields, now in the shadow of Centrepoint, where the condemned were given bowls of ale to comfort them on their final journey. Some were repentant, others stopped on the way for several final drinks and were almost insensible by the time they reached the scaffold. Officers on horseback were needed to restrain the crowds who cheered or booed their heroes or villains as they passed. It was customary for famous London criminals to wear white cockades in their hats as a sign of triumph or derision, or occasionally even of their innocence. Tyburn was an area of open fields well beyond the city near where Marble Arch now stands. The young Scotsman James Boswell on his first trip to London couldn't resist its gruesome attraction. I read so much in the lives of the convicts about Tyburn that I had a sort of horrid eagerness to be there. Accordingly, I got upon a scaffold very near the fatal tree so that I could see all the dismal scene. There was a most prodigious crowd of spectators. I was most terribly shocked and thrown into a very deep melancholy. The noise and confusion were immense. Wooden galleries were erected around the area as if there were stands at the race course. When the corpses were cut down, there was a general rush to touch them. The bodies of the hanged were believed to have healing powers. The Murder Act of 1752 was intended to increase the terror of the death penalty by giving up the corpses of convicted killers for public dissection by anatomists. The populace often come to blows as to who will carry the corpses to the relatives who are waiting in coaches, for the carriers are well paid for their trouble. You see most amusing scenes between the people who do not like the bodies to be cut up and the messengers the surgeons have sent for the bodies. Blows are given and returned before they can be got away. Such regular outbreaks of violence led to the banning of the hanging parades in 1783 when executions were transferred to the streets outside Newgate. The writer Dr Johnson was among those who mourned their passing. Dr Johnson told me, the age is running mad after innovation. Tyburn is not safe from the fury of innovation. Sir, it is not an improvement. Executions are intended to draw spectators. If they do not draw spectators, then they do not answer their purpose. The public is gratified by a procession. The criminal supported by it. Why should all this be swept away? The answer lay in the way London was growing and in what it was becoming. The hanging parades were stopped because their disorderly crowds offended the sensibilities of those who lived in the newer, smarter, western parts of town, like Mayfair. Georgian London was changing shape and changing style. It was a beast with two heads, split between the rich and poor, the old city to the east and the new West End.